Lieutenant, uh, I want to join Bob in, tell, uh, in expressing my uh, real admiration for the job you've done. I mean, you, uh, you are uh, a, a very entrepreneurial, gutsy guy who has worked very, very hard uh, on this problem. You were one of the few officials who, uh, who grasped the threat very early on, and you were responsible, your leadership for uh, making the agency run faster and uh, uh, and jump higher during your tenant uh, during your tenure and uh, and I admire you uh, for that another one of your virtues is that you're a team player and I think you uh, you have uh, resisted the temptation to uh, to, uh, to join in and recommendations for changes uh, because you're part uh, of the administration uh, but uh, last night, I think uh, things changed a bit in that the president uh, has now endorsed major reforms, institutional reforms, and I think that frees you up a little more to uh, to answer some uh, some questions. First, um, we've been struck by, and when I say we, I mean most of the commissioners and uh, and all of the staff, by a real difference between. Uh, our interaction with FBI and our interaction with the agency. Uh, the Bureau, while it's been defending uh, various actions and, uh, and issues, has, has fundamentally admitted they're in an agency that is deeply dysfunctional and broken and, uh, and uh, uh, make no bones about it. Whereas the attitude we kind of get from CIA is, is institutionally is that Hey, you know we're uh, we're the CIA. A kind of a smugness and even arrogance towards deep reform. And I'm not I'm not ready for your answer yet, but <laughs> this is all preamble. <laughs> I'm warming so, up, sir. Go ahead, you can interrupt. No, sir. <laughs> You're on a roll. But that report that you heard this morning was a damning report. Uh, not of your actions or the actions of any, any of the really superb and dedicated people that you have, uh, but it was a damning uh, evaluation of a, a system that is, is broken, that doesn't function. And all, all I have to do is reread the PDB, uh, which the agency resisted so strongly our declassifying, and the key line is, we have not been able to corroborate some of the more sensational threat reporting like the intention of bin Laden to hijack U.S. aircraft. All the King's horses and all the King's men in CIA could not corroborate what turned out to be true and told the President of the United States almost a month before the attack that they couldn't corroborate these reports. That's an institutional failure. And I'm here to tell you, and I'm sure you've heard it before, there is a train coming down the track. There are going to be very real changes made. And you are a, a, an invaluable part of helping us come to the right conclusions on that. So now I have a few questions. First, uh, why, why shouldn't we have a DCI who worries about the community with the authorities to do that uh, without having to worry about the day-to-day -day running of the uh, CIA. Um, can I get a little preamble time myself? <laughs> um, first as long of as all, it's on his time. It's on, Senator, <laughs> it's on Senator Kerry's time. First of all, I want you to know that I have serious issues with the staff statement as it was written today. I have serious issues about how the DCI's authorities have been used to integrate collection, operations, uh, when the staff statement says the DCI had no strategic plan to manage the war on terrorism, that's flat wrong. When the staff statement says I had no program strategic direction in place to integrate, correlate data and move data across the community, that's wrong. I, I just want to say to you that I would like to come back to the committee and give you my sense of it, at the same time telling you it ain't perfect. Um, and by no stretch of the imagination am I going to tell you that I've solved all the problems of the community in terms of integrating it and lashing it up, but we've made an enormous amount of progress. I would tell you also that for, this is the perspective I lived. Nobody else can live what I lived through. I believe that if you separate 
If you separate the DCI from troops, from operators and analysts, I have a concern about his, his or her effectiveness, his or her connection. Now, you may want to have a different structure. In, you may want to have a different CIA, sir, in terms of how you manage it. Uh, so there may be some things we can do there. Uh, but I wouldn't, separate, I wouldn't separate the individual from the institution. You may manage it differently. Because I believe that one of the concerns I have is, is if you create another layer and another staff between something that's supposed to provide central organization, all source analysis and operations, we've created another gap and a distance. So uh, I wouldn't design America's intelligence community 56 years later the way the National Security Act designed it. Uh, I would recognize that the key operational principle is not who's in charge of the wire diagrams, but the way data flows is integrated between analysis and operations, and in the 21st century, technology is your friend, not an enemy, and from a security perspective, it also makes your life easier. I would be very focused on organizing around missions and ensuring the capabilities were built, but the mission-focused and centers drove the way we operated against the things that mattered most to us in, in terms of a foreign intelligence target. You can structure on top of that you can lay anything you want on top of that, sir. Uh, but I, I think that that integration is what's key. And you can, you can figure out the wire diagrams and the authorities any way you want. But uh, I would tell you that the lesson is, yeah, of course, we need more change. Of course, I think, you know, if I can tell you, if, if, I've made, if I've failed or made a mistake, I've been evolutionary in terms of the community. Maybe I should have been more revolutionary. Uh, I sit back at night and look at, uh, a war in Iraq, a war on terrorism, conflict in Afghanistan, and all the things I have to do and recognize, you know, no single big human being can do all these things. I understand that. So maybe some structure is required. But I would also urge the Commission, and I will come back to you formally, to take a look at some significant things that have happened in the management of the community, of our resources, of our people, of our collection, of our training, of our education, because they are building blocks that, quite frankly, I'm proud of. Well, I think that, uh, that you're really making my point. I, I, I think that, uh, that uh, my experience in this town has been there are only two things that matter in, in doing management and oversight. Because everybody makes the same, same amount of money. You can't give bonuses to people. Uh, and your hiring and firing is somewhat limited. You've got the ability to hire and fire the top people if they don't perform and pick the ones that do perform and promote the ones that do perform. And you've got appropriations power. And neither of those things do you have for the responsibilities of cross-community. You've wielded them very well within your agency, but you, all you have for cross-agency, cross-community, is exhortation and the power of your logic, which has been powerful, but not powerful enough against big bureaucracy. So, why shouldn't you let's let's step into my Alice in Wonderland and you've been detached from uh, CIA you don't have to run it anymore <laughs> you are now you are now a a DCI who is principally seized of solving the problems that we have identified and you've struggled with for for these years why shouldn't you have the power to hire and fire more importantly the head of NSA, the head of the FBI intelligence section, uh, or a separate MI5, the head of the uh, CIA, the head of all of the alphabet soup that are really national intelligence assets. Why shouldn't you have that? Um, well, let me talk to you about my Alice in Wonderland, just to talk through this a little bit. Um, you, you could do that, sir. But I, I, I want to bring back an issue that I think is quite important here. Um, we, need to get, we need to understand the relationship between the DCI and the Secretary of Defense in a very, very fundamental way. Why? Um, you have an organizational structure today that basically has three, of the, three or four of the major organizations are combat support organizations. They provide tactical support to the military as well as support the national, the national intelligence needs. And somehow in the structure that you create, he must be a partner in designing this framework to ensure that we don't miss 
or don't crack a seam that we're trying to build together because he executes tactical and other programs that, in, in effect, add to the power of what the DCI can do. But we have to wrestle with that in some way. So everybody wants to empower this individual with all kinds of powers. And all I'm asking is, yeah, should, could a DCI be more powerful, have more executive authority, execute budgets, joint personnel policies? You know, the question ultimately is, is there a Goldwater-Nichols framework here that works? Uh, is there some new framework that we have to put in place? All I want to focus on is don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Don't miss the capabilities that have to be grown. Don't separate those capabilities from a chain of command that can only execute them and then figure out how that mesh works. Now, the person you described probably would survive for about 20 minutes um, <laughs> in terms of what's going on in this town. And you probably went a little bit too far. Um, but look, we have to be open to thinking like this. Uh, you know, I'm, I've done it one way. Uh, it ain't the perfect way and within the structure that I lived with. And the power of persuasion and cajoling is absolutely important because, you know, at the end of the day, you still have to lead. You're going to have all the authority you want. It may not matter. So it's a little bit more complicated, but all of it should be on, all I'm saying to you, commissioners, should all be on the table. But before we rush to a judgment, don't we want to know what the world's going to look like? Don't we want to understand with some precision where do you want to end up? And I think you have to focus on that fusion of capabilities around mission first and foremost and then decide the rest. It will flow from there. The power of forcing that collaboration in and of itself breaks down the walls. Well, I, I agree that the people and the personalities are, are the most important of all. But for instance, no matter how forceful you are, you have been unable, and no one without the uh, real authority over appropriations could uh, sort out the chaos of our security system, our background investigations, our uh, classification system. Uh, no one can do that without power. Uh, the networking. Uh, Goldwater Nichols is not one of my favorite pieces of legislation. But one of the things that it, it really achieved, which is a tremendous uh, uh, improvement, is, is forcing the, uh, and giving the sinks the, the ability to force the ability to the services to work together. For instance, special operations forces operated off aircraft carriers. They could never do that before because there was an authority that could force the commonality, the, the protocols, if you will. Like everybody in the commercial world uses the, the internet protocols. Uh, there are no protocols for the intelligence community for sharing. This is an IT problem. It's a, it's a deep embedded functional problem throughout the community for common protocols for uh, information. That is is really an issue of appropriations being cut on the hill or not being allocated within the agencies to do it. We heard testimony from the FBI who wanted to do that kind of thing and still hasn't done it because of the appropriations. So why shouldn't you as, as, as the, the, the new DCI have that appropriations authority at the top level? Not one of the bad things about Goldwater Nichols is it's increased the layers of bureaucracy at the center. We don't want that. No, we don't. But the GE and other good company model, where you have a very small, powerful uh, staff at the center, and execution uh, done in the departments is the model that is beginning to take shape in our mind. What do you think of that? It's a good model, sir. I mean, the power, the, power, it, the smaller the staffs, the more power you have over execution, the better off you're going to be at the end of the day with real metrics and power to move people and data as you need to to achieve better execution is a smart way to think about this discipline for the future. Now, I said this train is coming down the track, and you used the word revolution rather than evolution, and I think that's the perfect way for people to understand this. You've done a terrific job in the evolutionary change, but it's clearly not been enough. Revolution is coming. How do you do revolution without losing sight of the business that you're in? You can't take your eye off the ball. Do you think this can be done uh, in, a, in a rational way? Um, frankly, uh, my personal view is, is, is that you really do need uh, an outside group engagement, uh, recommendations to come forward, 
I think it's uh, people like me and John and people working in the business can certainly inform. Uh, I've got a group now I've put together on revolutionary change in the intelligence community and ideas that are flowing to me. I, I think you need something established to come back to you, react to you, push you and prod you and get you out of your skin and your daily responsibilities to get this done in the right way. I think it's hard when you're sitting. I mean, the day I retire, I'll be a great person to sit on one of these things, but, um, and I'd love to do it. But I think that, I think that the important thing is it's very hard for people when they're sitting in, they're sitting in the inbox and the crisis of the day to be reflective. And occasionally I have reflective thoughts. It's not often enough to deal with a problem like this. And I think you've got to separate the current group to allow you, we can give you the data, give you our experience and talk to you about it. But I, I think you almost need a separate group of people who have been around this. But you also need people who have revolutionary ideas about technology and how it works in a new mindset because the people you're recruiting aren't 30-year veterans anymore. You're attracting a whole new labor force that doesn't remember the Cold War, and they expect a structure that's going to be more agile and mobile and more technologically proficient. So we've got to take this in a different direction. The only thing I, the only thing I, I have to keep coming back to a point. My worst nightmare is, is that somebody's going to show up and say, all that human investment is wrong. All that technical investment is wrong. Where we've positioned ourselves has to be sustained creatively and innovatively. And, and I think you've got a way ahead in that regard that's quite impressive. And once people lose sight of where the country needs to be, the starts and fits and cycles that this community has gone through has to stop. You know, let's get budgeting on a two or three year cycle. Let's allow us to build programs in depth. Let's really look at base expenditures over the course of time. Let's put the metrics in place. But I'll tell you, you can't build this community in fits and starts. It won't happen, and the country will suffer. And you know, you know, this, I think, is a debate that has to be joined quite publicly. Um, everybody talks about military capability or law enforcement capability. Well, we're, we sit behind the green door. And for the bang for the buck, the American taxpayer gets a hell of a lot for what we give them. And, you know, we ought to find a way to talk to the American people about it as well, because I think they'd be supportive. Well, I had the preamble. I guess I ought to let you have the closing uh, peroration. Thank you. It's very helpful.